who's the worst main character we're supposed to sympathize with? That bitch from the bears that goes in their house and eats all their porridge. The kids from the Trix cereal commercials. All the rabbit wants to do is eat some cereal, but the kids won't let him just because he's a rabbit. Racist pricks. I remember when I was like somewhere between 6 to 10 years old or so, my parents took me to some kind of business convention, and one of the booths showing was, I guess, the cereal company that makes tricks, cause they had someone dressed up as the tricks rabbit or a mascot. I got some tricks, which I think they were giving out samples, and then I kept trying to insist that he take it, cause I kept thinking, or possibly even telling him, that those evil kids on the commercials are always taking away his cereal, and all he wants is some cereal, so here, you can have mine. Emily from Emily in Paris. She fucks up and barely suffers the consequences. Sleeping with a friend's partners and still remains friends with both of them openly. Screws up business opportunities, nothing besides a slap on the wrists, and somehow it's magically resolved. And her whole I am a dumb American, born apple tea. And she dresses like if Harry Styles was colorblind. Her bang the teen was when I noped out of there. Mark from Rent. I love Rent, but as I get older, the more ridiculous it gets. Mark is a rich kid who has parents that love him, but he runs off to cosplay as someone who is poor to make films which is really just him pointing his camera at poor people all day. He doesn't think he should have to pay rent to Benny because they were friends and he let them stay for free for a long time, and he thinks that should just last forever. Then he finally gets a job but quits because it was selling up. Ye I love rent, but yay, they were all shitty. Benny's like, you know how I let you stay here for free in my property for a long time. Well, I'd like to continue to let you stay here for free if you stop people from wrecking this new creative art thing and building. And you guys can even use it. Can you please just help stop people from ruining it? Because I feel like I'm not getting a lot here. Also, someone just murdered my dog. And they're just like, foo-woo-woo-woo-woo-woo. That stupid was Smith, Fish and Shark Tales. Gonna need to rewatch this with mature eyes. I remember liking this movie, but don't remember thinking he was an ass. Must have been too young. That dude from the notebook, if you don't go on a date with me, I'll kill myself. And you're supposed to watch it and be like, yay, Ryan Gosling is the better man. And Rachel McAdams needs to leave that swine James Marsden for him. When, in reality, Ryan Gosling's character is a total fucking weirdo, and James Marsden's character is just like a regular dude who treats her well and isn't evil or anything. Jack Teller from Sons of Anarchy. Dude's son straight up got kidnapped and his wife got injured, to the point she couldn't perform surgeries, because his stepdad put a hit out on her, and it still wasn't enough for him to leave his dumb motorcycle club. His wife begged him to leave for their safety, and he wouldn't. She tried to leave on her own with her children, and he stopped her. Then she ends up getting murdered by his psycho mom. Dude was a straight-up post. Jacks got terrible towards the end, but they also destroyed other characters too. The worst for me was Juice's whole secret blackmail storyline. I always thought of Sons of Anarchy as Hamlet on motorcycles. It was pretty apparent that no one on that show was getting a fairy tale ending. Kd Yeager from the newer Transformers movies. Was Sam a good main character? No, not at all. But damn, Cardi is horrible. In his first, let's say, 10 minutes on screen, we learn that he doesn't pay for his house, his electricity, he doesn't pay his employee, he is a shit inventor, overly protective of his daughter and all around an ass. And he only gets worse was that the one whose daughter was with a guy that had like an entire conversations out Romeo and Juliet laws. Whole thing just felt icky. That bald-headed little bastard from a kid's show who acts like a spoiled shit. Kylo did not want to go to the park today. Like all days, Kylo was being passive-aggressive. I always told my kids that Kylo had cancer, which is why he was bald and why his parents literally let him get away with anything and everything. They are fine preteens now, Lop. Evan Hansen, he's a legit monster. At least in the musical, he gets called out out for his actions by his friends and loses everything. The movie cut all that because God fucking forbid we hold him accountable for being a massive creep. He's the exact sort of protagonist written for young teens who they'll all be shocked they empathized with by the time they're 30. It has to be written in a way to make him a monster, right? If you cut out the horribly creepy stuff about dating the dead dude's sister, then everything would be mostly okay. But holy shit, there really is no reckoning that.
Jenny Nicholson's video about the movie was illuminating. His behavior is so creepy in context. Rav Grandpa Joe hurt. I'm assuming this is the same Joe as Charlie and the Chocolate Factory, the dude who suddenly got up and started walking as soon as it came to visiting the Chocolate Factory, W. Charlie. Sierra Burgess. She was a dick. One might even go as far as to say she's a loser. Sierra Burgess is a sexual predator. This is the thread where I learn how out of touch with popular culture I am. I only recognized Tom Jerry. I would have said Nate from Ted Lasso, but the show caught my vibe and turned him into the antagonist. I hope he doesn't get a redemption arc. I suspect he may. The star got one, the owner got one, the lackey got one, the three hooligans at the pub kind of got one. I'm bad with names. The writers are gonna have to do some next level shit if they want me to ever like Nate again. Nate's whole thing is he grew up without ever being good enough for his father. No matter what he did, his mother would blanket support him without really understanding the achievement. And his father would basically say it's not good enough. He transferred, like most people, his parental neglect to Ted, who saw him for his football analysis, uplifted him, and made him assistant coach. That should have been enough. He's a valued member of the team, respected and paid. However, because he's basically making Ted and his father the same person, any sign of neglect, no constant affirmation, not putting him in the spotlight all the time, etc., Nate sees Deed as doing exactly what his father did. That's why he's going into this villain arc. He's always been broken by his father, and he'll always see mentor's fathers as neglectful. You can also see this model in how he treats the new equipment manager. Rather than empathize with him because Nate was also in that position, he acts like his own father and makes sure the manager knows nothing he does is good enough. Point is, Nate is just as broken as everyone else in the show, and punishing him for that in the end would be a major mistake. Nate's either going to come home or finally learn and grow away from Ted. Dawson Leary from Dawson's Creek. The real villain was whomever was cutting Jen's hair. I was always teen Pacey D. Bitch. Rory Gilmore, whiny, narcissistic, cheated on multiple boyfriends. In hindsight, it's not a surprise she turned out how she did with everyone powdering her ass from day one of the show. The way she collapsed because one whole person told her she wasn't cut out for the career she wanted was proof of that. In any other show, that would be the point where the protagonist digs deeps to remember why they wanted that dream or realize their talents were better suited for something else. Instead, Rory trashes a boat, quits Yale for half the year, moves in with her grandparents because Lorelei put a foit up her ass for once, and then spun her wheels for the next decade after graduation, doing nothing of note while thinking her farts smelled of roses. Mitchum did absolutely nothing wrong, and boy was he ever vindicated in the sequel. <laughs> Carrie Bradshaw. In the reboot, Miranda steals the obnoxious crown right off her head though. Dear God, yes. She wails about a broken heel on her shoe, the way most people mourn the death of a child, neurotic, utterly self-absorbed, and hangs out with the three shallowest women in Manhattan. I watched it because my wife watched it. After a while, she turned to me and said, You know, these are really awful people, and they didn't even have the redemptive quality of being awful in an interesting way. Debbie Gallagher from Shameless, truly a horribly selfish, self-centered, and all-around horrible person. The Gallagher's are all supposed to be bad people. Still, I agree she was my least favorite character. They tried too hard to make her a Fiona replacement, and the character they had made with her just didn't fit that role, so it was this weird disjointed character arc. She was so much better as one of the younger kids, and the one desperate for an actual family, instead of a matriarchal role. All the nerds from Revenge of the Nerds. Everyone in that movie. Everyone. Yeah, that movie didn't age well at all. Awful stereotypes and oh, by the way, our hero raped a girl at the end, but he got her off so she liked it. Abba Lincoln from Clone High. It's kind of an obscure one season wonder from 20 years ago that not enough people cared about, but I feel a few fans will be here and agree with me. But did you see the pool? They flipped a bitch. Plus he eats babies and he's lying about his age. I like your funny words, magic man. Love that show, though it's so metasatirical that it's hard to tell if we're actually supposed to sympathize with A.B. Sure, he fills the role of the sympathetic protagonist, but I don't think the writers ever really intended for the audience to like him, or any of them really. Except Ponce de Leon, 
Of course, may be rest in peace. Such a memorable and important character taken from us far too early. Abe is total shithead, and Joan had no reason to be into him at any point in the show. Gandhi was the most likable out of the three. Tom Cruise in Risky Business. There's a setup in the beginning. He's in some business class where they're supposed to come up with some business idea. Then his parents go away for the weekend. Cue that famous scene. Tom Cruise, the protagonist and high school student, orders a prostitute. The prostitute turns out to be a man. But that prostitute gives him another number to call and he finally gets a girl and they back. Something happens where Cruz now needs money. He and the prostitute he's befriended decide to start a brothel in his parents' house. A brothel that caters exclusively to Cruz's high school friends. They make the money they need and then some. Parents come home none the wiser. We end with Tom Cruise back in the business class, failing the assignment because he was busy doing the whole child brothel thing, but ends with a voice, over where he's proudly saying how much money he actually made. Turns out he actually was a businessman. Emily from Emily in Paris. I keep joking about how everyone in this goddamn show is constantly offered incredible jobs. There was a pregnancy announced on the latest finale, and my first reaction was that Fetus Gonna be the CEO of a chain of daycares by the end of season four. I don't just find her annoying, I truly do not like her. She is a deeply toxic person. It's not just that she is spoiled and treat people around like they are just for her own personal benefit. It's how she do not care about the pain and problems she inflicts. She seemed regretful about being found out or getting consequences for her actions, but not about her actions themselves. It's always, I can explain. After she has had plenty of time and situations to come clear about something and, well, explain. But always only a last resort after lying and covering up. She is very manipulative and spins all situation to be about her or to her benefit. She plays the victim when she can and only apologizes to gain back control of a situation, but never really seemed to try and change her behavior. When I watch this with my girl, I always ask whose relationship or life she is going to ruin in this episode. Why? Because she bangs her friend's boyfriend and gets everything handed to her on a silver platter because she's hot and really, really lucky. I despise Emily. She's the worst example of an Amerlico I've ever seen in media. Doesn't speak French. No real effort to learn. No effort to adapt to her cultural surroundings. All of Paris must revolve around her inflexible narcissistic life. As an American who lived in France for years, it was one of the most cringe-worthy watches I've seen in a while. And yes, these people actually exist. And all this is besides her privilege, awful interactions with others, and otherwise obnoxious behavior. Edit. On reflection, the show would be amazing if they just changed the tone where Emily is shown to be the hilariously affluent piece of work that she is, similar to Michael Scott or Edmund Bladder. They could even readily add a laugh track. Tori Vega from Victorious. She kissed Beck in front of everyone just to get back at Jade, and she kissed Kat's boyfriend because she was jealous. And she didn't seem to care that her prom prevented Jade from doing her performance. Agreed. Also, I thought Kat and Jade were more impressive vocalists. It drove me crazy that Tori was the main character, despite most of the people around her being more talented and enjoyable to watch. Piper from Orange is the new Black. This is my first instinct as well, but I don't know that we're supposed to sympathize with her. It's the sort of show that makes me think it's intentional, mainly because we can with so many of the other characters. I think you're supposed to sympathize with her at the beginning, but then stop as the show goes on and she shows she's a terrible person. Greg from Diary of a Wimpy Kid. You were never supposed to sympathize with Greg. I think Jeff made him a narcissistic shithead on purpose so the audience could laugh whenever things didn't go his way. They never did. Okay, so I started to read the first book, but I didn't get very far into it because it felt off. This would be why. But I have a serious question. In the short chunk I read, it sounded to me like his parents, or his mom at least, were in fact also terrible. Would you agree that the parents suck too, or do we assume that the kid just paints them that way? What about the older brother? Kyle, yeah. That fucker basically teaches kids how to whine about shit because it's not fair. What's not fair is parents having to listen to their kids behave like that lollipop looking piece of shit. Fuck you, Chilo. You better hope I better never see your ass in the streets.
He can't grow hair, not because he has cancer or progeria, but because he sucks, and even his own body recognizes that he does not deserve hair or food or love. Fortunately, my seven-year-old daughter prefers Bluey and the Owl House. He's why contraceptives should be cheap. Fuck that punk. I'd beat that motherfucker's ass. Marty and Wendy Byard are total sociopaths. They destroy people's lives everywhere they go. Yet, I find myself rooting for them. It's weird I really was rooting for them until the end and never once does the show try to pretend that they aren't monsters. Eleanor Guthrie from Black Sails. We're supposed to root for her because of the situations she's often in struggling as an independent woman in a ruthless man's world of the 1700s, but she fucks over her supposed friends and everyone that's ever tried to help her at every opportunity, then turns around and is shocked, horrified, and plays the victim when they do it back. Classic narcissist. Ross and Rachel, they really do deserve each other. Despite his flaws, I will defend his reaction to the sandwich. His boss was a fucking cunt for doing what he did. While I do agree with this, I think it's partly a symptom of how us network TV works worked. You can't be confident you will have X number of series, or in the early days, if you'll even get to the end of the current one, so you can't write long-term plotline. Ross and Rachel were the classic will, they won't they until they did. But then there was another series, and another, and another. Each time, the writers had to do something with the relationship to keep it interesting. Not that they are blameless by any means. Look at Brooklyn 99 for how to handle this properly. Jake and Amy had the same initial dynamic, but once they got together, the rights they got together, the writers found way to make their relationship funny and interesting without having to constantly invent conflict. For that matter, even Monica and Chandler were handled better, though they didn't start seeing each other until Friends was well established, so the writers had more confidence it would last and that endings would be under their control. Finally, the first show characters I've seen in this thread that I recognize. I recently re-watched Friends and that group of six were awful to anyone who wasn't in their circle. Jerry from Tom and Jerry. Now nothing in the Tom Jerry verse is really consistent and a lot of their dynamic depends on whichever studio did the episode. But I remember a lot of times when Tom wasn't really trying to seriously hunt hurt Jerry. He was usually toying with him like cats do, or if he'd cross the line, he would immediately feel bad about it and then save Jerry himself. Meanwhile, Jerry, the little fuck we're supposed to root for, uses that to his advantage to lure Tom into situations that genuinely would kill him if not for cartoon immortality. I always rooted for Tom. In the newest movie, Jerry is a super prick. Everything that goes wrong is because he's being a jerk. You know the reason cats play with their food? It's safer for them. They exhaust their prey to where it's unlikely to be able to bite it back, as a bite to an animal, especially in the wild, can easily get infected and become fatal, and they do it as an instinct. <laughs> Meredith Grey. How many unknown sisters can one bitch have? Yes. Oh. Baby dies. Meredith Grey. Um, this is about me. Quothe from the King Killer Chronicle is a good one, but I think the entire point of that series is that the story is about the downfall of a hero, and it's supposed to all come crashing down after he gets too deep into his hubris. Not that we're ever going to find out or anything. Are you talking about Super Ninja Sex God, Master Magician, Quothe? Pepper Fing Pig, Little Brat, Pepper Pig, Daddy's Fat. George, fat fat. Mummy pig, daddy is fat. All three, laugh. Daddy pig, what a horrible family. Such an accurate portrayal of my kids' classmates though. Pepper is the absolute epitome of middle class. Spoiled child. Mummy and daddy pig need to take a good long hard look at their parenting and why everyone seems to already be at the park museum, a cinema, etc. Together without them whenever they go. Ted and the gang in How I Met Your Mother. They're terrible to a lot of people. Aid it. Barney literally admits to human trafficking, a woman in the Breckett episode, and they say he's a good guy 20 seconds later cause he apologized for forgetting a girl's name he slept with. And don't get me started on Ted. Marshall is a saint. The rest can burn in hell though.